high. Imagine that you're holding a pair of, of glasses. It's a pair of very special glasses because they'll give you neutron vision. Please join me in putting these glasses on, and let's view the world in a new light. I think you've all seen this kind of coffee pot before. It's made of solid aluminum, and you place it straight on the stove. With your neutron vision, you see straight through the aluminum and into the water boiling up through the coffee grounds. Why is that? Because neutrons go through metal the way light goes through glass. Now let me recalibrate your glasses to X-ray vision. With your X-ray vision, looking at this gun cartridge, you can see where the bullet is solid and whether it's a hollow compartment beneath it. Looks empty. Let's go back to neutron vision. With neutron vision, you can see that it isn't empty. It's got gunpowder in it. This image is of a petrified dinosaur egg. It's about 10 centimeters across, and it was found in the Mongolian Gobi Desert in 2008. With your neutron vision, you can penetrate the rock, and you can discern between different areas of the rock that have different elemental composition. Can you see what I see? There's a tiny little titanosaur embryo petrified in this egg. If it had hatched, it would have woken up about 100 million years ago in a humid veil in what we call Mongolia today, in one of the largest titanosaur nesting grounds. But it didn't. Something happened. And instead, it was preserved over the eons for us to discover. You can take your glasses off now. Neutron vision is a powerful tool for science. And I want to tell you about neutron facilities and about the power of curiosity-driven research. Now, the neutron, you may recall this from your high school physics, the neutron is a particle that you find in the nucleus of almost all atoms. You can say it's the glue that holds the protons together in there. And around this nucleus, you have the electrons. Together, this is an atom. The existence of this particle, the neutron, was predicted theoretically in 1920, but it would take another 12 years before physicists actually discovered experimentally the particle. Once they were able to measure this particle, it didn't take long before physicists realized that if we rip this neutron out of its comfortable home in the nucleus, we can use it to study other molecules, to study and understand the matter around us. And one of the very first lines of inquiry was magnetism. Now, magnetism, we're all familiar with it. This invisible push or pull between magnetic object objects is quite fascinating. But did you know that there is magnetism virtually everywhere? Every single electron in every single atom in any given object has a tiny little magnetic moment with a south and a north direction. And yet, most stuff isn't magnetic. And that has its reasons. If you look inside an atom, you'll find many electrons with these little magnets. And most of these electrons will pair up in a way that the magnets cancel out one another. So the net magnetism of such an atom will be zero. Now, of course, you'll have situations where there's an odd one out. Then, yes, the atom is a little bit magnetic. And that's where it gets interesting. Because when these magnetic atoms form materials, different things can happen. One example is iron. The atoms of iron will line up their magnetic moments in parallel, well-ordered, in the same direction. This is why iron is magnetic. It will be drawn to a, to a magnet. But for most materials, that doesn't happen. Even though the atoms have a, a well-defined structure, their magnetic moments will be pointing all over the place, any which way. And this also cancels out. The net magnetic moment will be nothing, and it won't be a magnetic material. But then you have these really interesting materials where 
the most exquisite patterns of magnetism appear. Like, for instance, the spin vortex, where the atoms line up their magnetic moments along a circular path, spiraling inwards towards an invisible center. This is beautiful new physics. It's really exciting. And you can study it directly using neutrons, because the neutron has a little magnetic moment itself. Now, the initial discoveries here were made in the 30s and 40s, were awarded Nobel Prizes decades later because it was really important discoveries for physics and chemistry. But already in the 1980s, this body of solid physical understanding began giving back to society. So what was going on in the 80s? Computers. From being something that just existed in a few well-equipped labs, computers were showing up in offices and homes everywhere. What made this possible? Well, a number of technologies, but one of them was the ability to store information in compact ways. The ones and zeros of your emails and contacts and prescriptions and high scores, they're stored magnetically in some pretty advanced high-tech materials. And the beginning of that development came out of those fundamental studies of magnetism, researchers wanting to understand how this actually works. I love this example of how fundamental research, which wasn't application-driven, has actually led to the development of technology that's revolutionized society. Today's life hacks rest on the scientific discovery of the 20th century. And I think this is an important point to make. If we want to solve the challenges that face us, we can't just stare ourselves blind at those challenges. Because if we do, we'll only limit our mindsets and we won't be able to think the big thoughts. If we want to solve the challenges that society is faced with, and if we want to be prepared to solve the challenges we don't even know we have yet, we have to set science free and give it room. The applications will present themselves, although we don't quite know when and where. Despite their legacy in physics, neutrons isn't all about physics. At the other end of the, uh, life of the natural science spectrum, we have life science. Uh, I'm a life scientist myself, and uh, it's a discipline with a lot of obviously important applications in health and environment and agriculture. But to me, life science is about discovery and understanding. How does, how does this collection of carbohydrates and proteins and lipids self-organize into a functioning life form? Why am I not just a puddle of goo on the floor, rapidly deteriorating? The number of chemical reactions going on in your body every minute is astounding. And the number of things that go wrong is absolutely terrifying. The way the body heals and self-debugs in a way that very few of these mistakes have consequences is truly amazing. Understanding disease is a part of understanding life. Look at this protein. It's called carbonic anhydrase. You all have it in almost all your tissues. You have it in your kidneys, in your liver, in your heart, in your muscle, in your bone, in your eyes even, and in your bloodstream. It has a really important job. It uh, makes sure that the carbon dioxide that's exhausted by your cells make it to the lungs to be exhaled. And it does this all the time. We're breathing all the time. And as it does this, it also makes sure that we're not carbonated from the inside, from all the carbon dioxide we produce. And it regulates pH, or acidity levels, in our different tissues. Now, pH, it's an ambient characteristic, kind of like temperature. If the temperature drops in a room, everybody in that room will adapt. Someone grabs a sweater, somebody pours a hot drink, someone hugs their boyfriend, and in the same way, when the pH is misregulated somewhere, all the proteins and all the chemistry going on around 
will adapt to the new conditions. And this is not necessarily a good thing. If pH is misregulated in some tissue, you can get cancer, you can get glaucoma leading to blindness, you can get high blood pressure shortening your life. And for that reason, we want to not under only understand this molecule, we want to be able to manipulate it through medication. Now I'm zooming into the middle of the molecule, of the protein, and there you see a small molecule floating in the middle. This is a drug candidate. It uh, doesn't have any hard connections to the protein anywhere. Uh, rather, it floats in a pocket of approximately the right shape. And you see all through that picture, you see white stubs. White stubs coming out of the drug molecule and white stubs coming out of the protein. And these are hydrogens. And the hydrogens work in concert with many subtle interactions to make sure that this molecule sits in just the right position to do its thing. This is very typical of biology and life science. There aren't a lot of hard connections, but there are many, many, many soft connections that work together to form a robust system that still has a lot of flexibility. So, when pharmaceutical developers want to make informed decisions on how to move forward in developing the next drug, they need to understand where the hydrogens are and what the proton bonding network looks like. They need to have this kind of data. Um, unfortunately, it's hard to come by. Neutrons, uniquely, can give this kind of information, but the way it looks today, the neutron sources are too weak to study these kinds of life science samples, with a few exceptions. You're looking at one exception here. But this is about to change, actually. The uh, next generation neutron source for science is being built right here in Lund, Sweden by a collaboration of 15 different countries. It's called the European Spallation Source, and it's where I work. We're in mid-construction, and uh, at a price tag of 1.8 billion euros, we're building 16 different instruments, where scientists from all over the world will be able to come and do their different experiments. We open in 2023. This sounds like a really long time, but it's in fact a very aggressive time schedule. There's a lot that has to happen before then. Lots of different competences are required in order to pull something like that. this off. We need accelerator physicists, nuclear physicists, neutron uh, scientists. We need people who can build infrastructure to host this kind of equipment. Uh, and to get that, we, uh, we work collaboratively. There are about 100 labs ac across Europe that are actively working and contributing to this project here. Here at headquarters, I have nearly 400 colleagues, and they're from 48 different countries. People who have taken their families and moved here because they want to join this exciting project. Now, I get the question sometimes, um, isn't it difficult working with people with so many different backgrounds from so many different countries and cultures? No, it's not difficult, not at all. What they should ask is, what is, what is it like to work with so many different professions? Scientists always looking for what's possible, engineers always looking for what might go wrong, project managers trying to squeeze the vision into schedule and budget, and the construction professionals who just wish the scientists would make up their minds. <laughs> um, that's a little bit difficult. Then we have the political aspects. 15 countries, that's 15 different research funding schemes, different priorities, different regulatory frameworks. That is challenging as well. And sometimes when, when I look at this multifaceted complexity that we face, it's, it's a bit overwhelming. But the fact is that this is big science at its best, pushing the limits of what's technologically possible, pushing the limits of international collaboration. When I look at this project and other projects like it, I feel proud to be human. We, as a species, we choose to dive into these projects of guaranteed difficulties because we know it's going to be worth it. Big science facilities don't only create jobs, they create ideas and new technologies, both the ones that are kind of expected and the ones that we have no idea are coming. 
and they give us the tools to face up to the challenges that we'll have. So what will the life hacks be 20 years from now when we're running this facility? Like we didn't need the internet before we had it, and I wouldn't have asked for a smartphone until I saw one. I don't know. Any guess would undershoot reality. But we build the tools, and we train our brains, and we push science forward on any, every frontier that we know of now. And we'll be ready. That's the neutron vision. And when I put on my neutron glasses, the future looks bright. Thank you. <laughs>